Welcome to News Wrap Local. I'm your host, Justin Chapman. Happy Jewish American Heritage Month and Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. It's been on, we've been on the air for over a year now, so thanks so much for watching. After providing a few brief updates on this month's local stories, we'll speak with our guest, affordable housing advocate, Michelle White, about the up upcoming rent control charter amendment ballot measure. But before we get started, let's check out these Pasadena Media News Books. Pasadena City College enrollment has declined steadily over successive spring semesters since 2019. Colleges across the nation are facing student enrollment numbers in decline. Enrollment in community colleges across the nation has dropped 13 percent between 2019 and 2021. According to Alex Bokelheide, Director of Strategic Communications and Marketing at PCC, Enrollment at PCC declined steadily since 2019. Despite the slide in enrollment, Bokelheide said no employees were laid off. The college's revenues have remained steady since the pandemic started, and Bokelheide attributed this to the actions taken by the legislature and the governor's office to keep funding for California's community colleges in a hold harmless position. PCC has not made any changes in terms of the programs being offered to students despite the decrease in enrollment. Most PCC students returned to campus for in-person classes in January despite appeals from some teachers and students to continue remote learning. The Pasadena City Council passed a resolution allowing it and its subordinate bodies to hold teleconference meetings until May 11th. The Council and all of its subordinate bodies have been meeting remotely since the COVID-19 pandemic began in March 2020. In its meeting of March 21st, the City Council adopted a resolution allowing remote meetings for 30 days until April 20th. In the same meeting, Mayor Victor Gordo stated that it is the intent of the City Council to return to in-person meetings. The Council must pass a resolution every 30 days to continue meeting online under the terms of Assembly Bill 361. Mayor Victor Gordo said he did not know if attendance would be limited when the Council Chambers are reopened. Several local residents have accused the City Council of holding virtual meetings to avoid answering residents' questions. It is unclear if there will be discussion on the possible return to in-person meetings because the item is under the consent agenda. Changes may soon be coming to Pasadena's cannabis retail industry. A ballot known as the People's Initiative to establish local ownership of commercial cannabis retail businesses could change the city's municipal code to allow 11 cannabis licenses half of which must be social equity applicants and local residents impacted by the war on drugs. In anticipation of the city implementing a social equity program for cannabis licenses, a cannabis business incubator has been organized. The Pasadena Cannabis Social Equity Program will provide funding to social equity applicants in programs aimed at helping blacks and Latinos expunge their records take part in the local cannabis industry, and address the long-term impact that cannabis enforcement policies have had on people living in Pasadena. On March 31st, community activists, would-be entrepreneurs, and licensed cannabis dealers participated in Cannabis Business and Community Reinvestment, a conversation, an online conference designed to generate ideas and opportunities for small businesses and the community to join Pasadena's Cannabis Marketplace. Be sure to watch the recent Pasadena City Council Candidates Forum hosted by Pasadena Star News, Pasadena Community Coalition, and NewsWrap Local. Brennan Dixon of the Star News and I served as the two panelists asking the candidates questions. You can find the forum on the Southern California News Group's YouTube and on Pasadena Media. Let's turn next to our lightning round of news updates. One, the Rent Control and Just Cause Eviction Charter Amendment measure has qualified for the November ballot. Charter amendments are very rare on Pasadena ballots because they require a large number of signatures. The campaign will host a launch party tomorrow, May 21st, from 2 to 5 p.m. at 1516 Navarro Avenue. 
the city council directed city staff to prepare an impact report on the measure. Two, the Pasadena City Council unanimously passed a zoning code amendment prohibiting the application of Senate Bill 9 within the city's landmark districts. SB 9 requires cities to approve the subdivision of one single family residential zone lot into two. Mayor Victor Gordo said State Attorney General uh, Rob Bonta, quote, got it wrong and unfairly targeted Pasadena when he sent the city a letter claiming that a recent municipal ordinance violated SB 9. However, Bonta praised the city for its recent zoning code amendment after saying local landmark districts were not exempt from SB 9 back in March. Now he said the amendment was the result of collaboration between the state's housing strike force and the city of Pasadena. Three, lots of news on the police front. Pasadena's next permanent police chief will make at least $233,525. Former Commander Jason Clausen recently took over as interim chief from Cheryl Moody, who announced her retirement effective May 23rd. The city has hired Coffin Associates as a consultant to conduct the search, which hosted a contentious town hall two days ago to collect public input. The position is not expected to be filled until after the city selects its permanent city manager. Candidates for that position will be interviewed by the council next month. Meanwhile, the city has approved a one-year $150,000 contract with Dr. Richard Rosenthal, who will serve as the new independent police auditor, a position he has held for Portland, Oregon and Denver, Colorado. Also. The Pasadena Police Department has submitted an operating budget of $97.9 million, a 5.6% increase from the current budget. And the city council directed the city attorney to draft an ordinance to bring the police department into compliance with AB 481, a new law that requires law enforcement agencies to establish policies and obtain approvals from governing bodies before obtaining military equipment. Four, the city council approved the 710 stub relinquishment agreement with Caltrans, putting the final nail in the coffin of the 710 North Freeway extension. That includes nearly 2.5 million square feet of potential development. The agreement now goes before the California Transportation Commission in June for final approval. There was a consensus at the recent council candidates forum that African Americans and Japanese Americans should take priority in terms of housing that gets built on that land, as it was their communities who had their homes taken away and bore the brunt of the damage when Caltrans built that freeway decades ago. Once the relinquishment is finalized, public outreach will be conducted this year to rework the stub back into the fabric of the city. Five, the city council has officially adopted an ordinance to end the commercial and residential eviction moratorium that's been in place since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Pasadena Housing Director Bill Wang said that in order to mitigate the impacts of the repeal, $2.6 million will fund a number of programs being planned to assist impacted tenants, including additional funding for the Housing Rights Center to provide limited legal services, emergency rental assistance, and tenant-based rental assistance. Six, the city hosted a community workshop on May 11th to solicit input as it seeks to adopt a formal social equity program for legal cannabis. The goal of the program is to support those who were disproportionately harmed by the war on drugs and the criminalization of cannabis for decades and the discriminatory law enforcement practices that went along with that. A city press release said cannabis businesses must commit to investing in the community through enhancing education, legal aid, youth development programs, and violence prevention. At the recent candidates forum, there was a consensus that social equity is critical for Pasadena. Seven, Pasadena's homeless count declined slightly from two years ago. On the night of the count in January, volunteers counted 512 people experiencing homelessness in Pasadena, down from 527 in 2020. The count was not held last year due to the pandemic. A city staff report said that housing affordability and availability is the root cause of homelessness as two thirds of those counted lived in Pasadena for an average of 18 years prior to losing their home. Eight, city council member Tyrone Hampton wants the council to remove the portrait, former Pasadena mayor Albert Stewart from city hall and to strip the 1974 Arthur Noble award from former Hahn and Hahn managing partner, Herbert Hahn and to remove a plaque honoring Hahn from council chambers. He also wants to replace those items with a plaque that condemns their racial segregation campaigns. Nine, tens of thousands of abortion rights protesters demonstrated in Pasadena and cities throughout Southern California and across the country last weekend to fight back against the Supreme Court's pending decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. A recent CNN poll found that 69% of Americans oppose the Supreme Court completely overturning Roe, while just 30% of Americans support it. California is poised to become a safe haven for abortion rights if the ruling goes through as expected this summer. And 10, a majority of the full-time PCC faculty, 276 out of 415, 
supported a vote of no confidence in PCC Superintendent and President Dr. Erica Endrahonis. The vote followed another vote of no confidence in the superintendent by the Academic Senate Board last month. Let's patch in our guest, Michelle White. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Glad to be here. Michelle White is chair of the Affordable Pasadena Steering Committee, which recently qualified its rent control and just cause evic eviction measure for Pasadena's November 2022 election. She is also executive director of Affordable Housing Services, which is a nonprofit specializing in producing units that are affordable for low and very low income persons with disabilities, persons of color and families. She previously served as executive director of the Fair Housing Congress of Southern California and was a civil rights assistant to the federal regulator of national National banks. She has a JD from Rutgers University. After law school, she served as a litigator with the Justice Department Civil Rights Division. Most of her work has been in fair and affordable housing advocacy. So Michelle, housing advocates have been trying to get rent control in Pasadena for 20 years. So tell us about this new rent control charter amendment ballot measure. What would it do if Pasadena voters approve it in November? It would uh stabilize the rents for renters uh, at 75% of the inflation. Uh, and it would also set up a registry for uh, rental units, a board that would uh, uh, do a number of things related to the, uh, the administration of this effort, and also uh, make sure that the reasons that people are evicted are good ones, not just that the, the landlord uh, wants to increase their profits. So, so what's a, a, a just cause eviction, for example? Just cause eviction would be if someone is, uh, a renter is failing to pay rent, uh, not cooperating with the landlord and making sure, making a nuisance, uh, not obeying the rules, uh, in general, uh, being at fault and not complying with the lease. Uh, there are other reasons that you could be evicted uh, that would not be a fault eviction uh, if for some reason the landlord decided that he or she was going out of the business and wanted to uh, end renting, uh, then that would be a reason if they wanted to bring in family members or they wanted to uh, uh, comply with a, a government uh, dictate that uh, they rehab the units because they're not habitable. And th this rental housing board that would be established, what would their responsibilities be? Well, the rental housing board would consist of 11 people, seven of whom would be uh, renters or ten tenants from each one of the districts, and uh, they would be appointed by city council. The uh, board would be responsible for making sure that uh, the rents are consistent with uh, the inflation uh, barometer that uh, I talked about earlier. Uh, and if for some reason uh, landlords decide that they just cannot make a decent profit, it would be to the, uh, the board that they would appeal and try to get an increase in rents. If, however, uh, tenants were unable to get uh, the landlords to make uh, reforms or repairs to ensure that the unit is habitable, then they would appeal to the uh, the board. And then it also establishes a, a rental registry, right? What would that look like? Yes, the rental registry would be of all rental units in the city. It's something that uh, I remember Sid Tyler, who was many years ago, was trying to get a rental registry and if we do this, then we would know who's renting, how much they're renting for, uh, that they have a business license, that it's habitable, uh, and that the, the rental increases are consistent with the, uh, uh, the initiative that we're talking about. And so tell us about why this rent control measure is needed right now. 
Well, uh, like you said, we've been trying to get a rent uh, control measure and just cause eviction for at least 20 years. Uh, previously, people were going through the housing element and trying to do it that way. Uh, now we've uh, just given up on using the, the internal method and we're going to the initiative. The initiative uh, is because over a period of say from 2012 to 2018, we had a 32% increase in the rents in Pasadena, whereas uh, across the county, uh, the rents only went up 12.4%. 12, 12 uh, in addition to that, uh, more than 70% of black tenants are uh, paying more than a third of their income, uh, I'm sorry, more than 30% of their income on uh, rent. And uh, those individuals who are uh, making between 10 and 50, per, uh, per, I'm sorry, 10 and $50,000 are paying even more uh, of their rent in, uh, I'm sorry, of their income in rent. So there have been escalating costs over the years. And uh, when we had the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, Pasadena had the highest rate of increase in rents uh, before they put into effect the anti-rent gouging law that was uh, done on a statewide basis. So obviously we have the, the twin pressures of the, the pa economic disruptions of the pandemic and rising rents and, and housing costs. Um, so that in, in response to the, the measure being qualified for the ballot, the city council has directed city staff to conduct an impact report on this measure. What, what do you think that's about? Well, uh, the city council is permitted to do that under uh, the initiative uh, provisions of state law. So they've taken advantage of that. and. Uh, the planning department has been charged with uh, doing the study. I do believe that the housing department is also going to be involved in this. Uh, we hope that it'll be a balanced uh, approach to the analysis. We want to make sure that not only the realtors are uh, interviewed and their side of the story is uh, put into effect or an uh, the analysis is done, uh, but also tenants and uh, advocates for rent control. Uh, this is important because uh, we know that Bill Long, who is the housing director, has long been an opponent of rent control. I hope that he's perhaps changed his mind over the last few years, but if that's not the case, we need to at least have renters who have been uh, so very hard hit by this measure be able to uh, talk about why it's important to have uh, rent control in the city of Pasadena. And also with the uh, the uh, eviction moratorium being lifted uh, after a couple of years. Yes, um, abs absolutely. And uh, a lot of people think that we have rent control and just cause eviction uh, protections on the state level, but those didn't go into effect until um, uh, 2022, which was after some of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, was already in effect and people were losing their jobs, et cetera. And it will go out of uh, effect in 2030. So we're uh, we're in a position where we're going to lose those protections and they're not really strong protections because this is anti-gouging that says that if you go above this, then you're gouging tenants, but it doesn't give all the protections that we have in mind for the initiative. Right. And there's this sort of tense battle going on right now between the city and, and the state over housing laws such as SB9. What, what's your take on that? And do you, do you think that, uh, you know, so-called granny flats, uh, uh, ADUs, and subdividing single-family residential lots will help ease this uh, housing burden? 
Well, I think anything that we can do to create more units, especially affordable units, we need to do. And the city has a long history of uh, resisting doing a ADUs, uh, especially in historic districts. And that's the kind of thing that they're uh, fighting to preserve at this point. Uh, for the longest time, we had an ADU uh, law in effect, or ordinance in effect, but it was written in such a restrictive way that the people who most needed it were not able to access it because you had to have a 15,000 square foot uh, lot in order to uh, access, be able to build the units. And of course, in Northwest Pasadena, where there are a lot of people who were pushing for uh, the ADUs, uh, they, the average size was uh, 6,500. So they were just excluded from that. So we have, our city has a history of protecting historic districts, and that's part of what's going on right now. Uh, to, uh, we have uh, the AG who is uh, criticizing the city for the extent to which they're trying to protect uh, historic landmark districts from affordable housing so and, and ADUs uh, we don't think that affordable housing needs any you don't need to be protected from affordable housing obviously uh, what you need are more units and it should be spread across the city and it can be done in such a way that the historic nature of the landmark districts are preserved, but we still get more units. And and, and what are some other things that uh, cities like Pasadena could do to help the housing situation? Is it higher in lieu fees from developers? Is it housing on church properties? What, what are some other solutions? Well, I, I think that we should get rid of in lieu fees entirely and make uh, developers who are choosing to build in the city uh, actually build the inclusionary units. So in lieu fees, I, I know a lot of my advocate uh, partners uh, like the idea of having the in lieu fees, but we kind of uh, differ in that regard. Uh, the other thing is uh, perhaps a vacancy tax. Our real problem is not the mom and pop landlords who are trying to make a, a living. It is the large corporate uh, entities that are buying up single family and larger uh, rental units and then holding them vacant until they get at least market rate, if not more than market rate uh, rents. Uh, so if we can do some kind of uh, vacancy tax and eliminate the um, the ability of, or at least penalize uh, landlords who do that, uh, then we would be in a position of uh, creating some more income for the city and at the same time in, uh, you know, making sure that they uh, have units that are being uh, actually habited. Uh, Another approach would be to take another look at the Airbnb units. Uh, we have a fair number of Airbnb units and we are now in the p position of competing. Uh, they are uh, keeping the rents high and then they take the units off the market uh, when they don't need them to be uh, to make the money that they they anticipate for the year. So they could have units only there for, uh, you know, one or two months a year and then withdraw them. Uh, so we still need those units. Gotcha. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us about the rent control measure, which passing voters will get to decide on in November. Thank you. It's really good to see you again. It's been a while, Justin. You too. Take care. Take care. 
Before we go, here is this month in Pasadena history. It was this month in 1937 when 22 year old El Sereno resident Myrtle Ward threw her three year old daughter Jeanette off the highest point of Colorado Street Bridge and then jumped herself because of the financial pressures of the Great Depression. It's perhaps the most well known such incident, one of far too many that gave the bridge its unfortunate and inf in infamous nickname. And it's an issue we're still dealing with today, 85 years later. According to Ann Erdman's Mystery History blog, Jeanette's fall was broken by a tree branch before she landed on a small soft spot of sand in the Arroyo Seco stream bed. She survived, but her mother died three days later at Huntington Hospital. Jeanette went on to be raised by her paternal grandmother. Thank you all so much for joining me for this episode of News Wrap Local. Turn, tune in every third Friday of the month at 5 p.m. Learn more at passionmedia.org and justindouglaschapman.com. Sign up for my monthly email newsletter to get updates on my work by visiting justinchapman.substack.com. See you again next month.